transforming institutions delivering for all women and men. This event is jointly organized by the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. My name is Hanna Jogovic and I work as program officer for the OSC PA's International Secretariat in Vienna, together with my dear colleague and friend, uh, Sasha Gavric, Associate Gender Officer at ODIR, I will be facilitating this event. Hello, Sasha. Good morning, dear Hanna. Um, good uh, morning, good uh, afternoon, good uh, evening, dear participants. Um, before we start with today's event, uh, we would like to acknowledge that it is taking place against tragic developments in Ukraine caused by the military attack by the Russian Federation, which has caused suffering of hundreds of thousands of civilians, including women and children. Despite these difficult circumstances, we are holding this event to mark our long-term cooperation on the important issue on gender equality in Parliament. Therefore, over the next two hours, we will be exchanging views on how national parliaments as essential democratic institutions can champion progress towards gender equality in politics and indeed in all spheres. This crucial role for parliaments has been well entrenched in different international conventions and commitments, such as for instance, the 1995 Beijing Declaration. In the aftermath of this declaration, the concept of gender sensitive parliaments has become basically the clearest expression of parliament's responsibility to promote gender equality uh, and achieve it in their own institutions. Today, we will in fact focus on discussing innovative approaches on gender sensitive parliaments and how uh, the transformation of, of national legislatures can happen to better deliver for all women and men. Having said that, today's event has two aims. On one hand, to provide a platform for exchange of good practices and lessons learned on how national parliaments are mainstreaming gender in their composition, structures, operations, working methods, and their everyday work. On the other hand, it aims to raise awareness among parliamentarians of OSC participating states of different OSC tools and resources, including ODIR's new guide on realizing gender equality in parliament, a guide for parliaments in the OSC region. Before we begin, um, Sasha, would you like to provide a brief overview of the agenda and mention some uh, important technical details for today's event? Thank you, dear Hannah. Uh, dear participants, we have prepared, uh, prepared a great program for today. Um, after the welcoming words by Honorable Margareta Sederfeld, uh, President of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, and Katarina Riabiko, First Deputy Director of ODIR, we will immediately move into the working part of our web dialogue event. Sonia Palmieri, ODIR's international consultant, will introduce the new ODIR guide titled Realizing Gender Equality in Parliament, aiming to inspire a discussion, but also mid- and long-term change in parliaments. After Sonia's presentation, three panelists, Hedy Fry, member of the House of Commons of Canada and OSC PA Special Representative on Gender Issues, Clodilda Bushka, member of the Assembly of Albania and chair of the Legal Affairs Committee in the Albanian Parliament, and Meg Mann, international expert on gender sensitive parliaments and former UK MP and minister, will open the discussion. We are looking forward to a lively debate among participants, keeping in focus both the regional dynamics and the specific role of parliamentarians. We will close today's event with concluding remarks by Odir's Yulia Netesova, Chief of Democratic Governance and Gender Unit, issuing a call for action with a concrete proposal of five steps to be taken by parliaments. Allow me now just a few technical announcements before we begin. Please note that this event is being recorded and live streamed. It is taking place in English language, 
interpretation into Russian and international sign language is provided. Requests to speak should be written into the Zoom chat. My colleagues will collect all the requests and Hannah will then give you the floor during the debate. To ensure a smooth experience, I kindly ask all participants to mute, mute their mic microphone when not speaking. I would like to encourage you to keep your cameras on during the entire event, as this is also an opportunity to see and virtually meet each other. Finally, I would encourage all speakers from the floor to limit their intervention to maximum three minutes during the debate. Thank you, dear Sasha. Uh, without further delay, it is my pleasure to give the floor to the president of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, Ms. Margareta Sederfeld, who is connected from Washington, DC, due to her official visit to the United States. Ms. Sederfeld, I'm sure you are aware, is a distinguished Swedish parliamentarian who was elected last July as OSC PA president. Ms. Sederfeld, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dragovic. I, this thing is guests, dear colleagues, fellow parliamentarians. I wish to warmly welcome you to this important and very timely web dialogue. This time focusing on realizing gender equality in parliaments. But I would first like to send my best you regards to the Ukrainian people. In our CEPA, we have since long time focused very much in support of peace building. And we have also taken steps and action to promote peace in Ukraine with respect of Ukraine's integrity and rights to its territory. And I condemn the Russian illegal war and do as all others say, please stop the war. It's not right to go to attack to an other OSCE country. But today's topic is on gender. And it's really a true pleasure to open this event together with Ms. Katarina Riabiko, first deputy of ODIR. We value our close cooperation with ODIR at all levels, uh, mutual uh, through our common engagement in implementing the OSCE uh, acquis. I would like to express my full support for this event. Gender equality is and will remain one of the main priorities in my capacity as president. Starting from 1995, Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the vital role of parliamentarians, uh, parliaments is achieving gender equality has been outlined in many international documents. The OSCE, including the ODIR and OSCEPA, has also worked hard to develop uh, its own comprehensive framework in this regard. In 2005, for instance, the OSCE PA adopted the resolution on improving gender equality in the OSCE region, inviting all members of OSCE Parliamentary Assembly to promote participation of women in politics and civil society building in their home countries, starting at their respective constituencies. Therefore, our responsibility is clear and will be maintained. <laughs> Dear colleagues, the guide of realizing gender equality in parliament, which we are launching today is extremely important for several reasons. UDIR and OSCPA have studied 46 out of 56 parliaments in our region and gathered many good practices and lessons learned on the gender sensitivity, which is truly remarkable. At this point, I would like to sincerely thank 
uh, the OECP assemblies national delegations for their substantial contribution to the guide despite their other commitments. While today is an important opportunity to discuss the development of this valuable document and its con content, there is another aspect we could uh, should keep in mind even more crucial. And dear colleagues, in our discussions later today, we should implement, uh, we should brainstorm on how to further promote and support implementation of this guide within our national parliaments. And I say this because I think it's at the national level, everything starts. In OSCE, Parliamentary Assembly. It's about 24%, less than 24% of the delegates are women. But it's depending on the decision taking at the national level because it's the nat individual parliaments who decide who should attend their delegations. But if there should be more women in the delegations, there need also to be more women in the parliament. So it goes together. And I would say it's not only about numbers, it's also about positions, about women as spokespersons, about women in leader positions as chair or deputy chairs of committees, as party leaders, at, as whippers. And I would like to mention here, as I said, uh, I am leading an OECPA delegation to US. We have visited the United Nations uh, on this Monday and uh, last week. And now we are in Washington visiting uh, the Senate, uh, the House of Representatives. And yesterday we met uh, with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Ms. Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she is re-elected for fourth time as speaker, I must say, I am very impressed and also impressed that she has to hold this position for a very long time. But her message, her message is very strong for democracy, for equality, for e equally, and also for women's rights. And I think this is important to also have women on the highest top position because it gives a maneuver to act. It gives also the perspective of women at the highest level. Uh, but I would like to continue here to also say, on one hand, we should strive to find the ways to transform our parliament into truly gender equal democratic institutions. And on the other, we as parliamentarians should act as an example and provide leadership in of working towards achieving gender equality in politics in general and in our societies. And I see this as well as a very important issue. Uh, in my country, Sweden, uh, women are about 44% of the, in, in the parliament. And we have achieved this without quota. It's achieved because women have the possibility to be active in politics, to graduate from exams, uh, from universities, but also are expected to take part in, in the labor market. And of course, gender to also start back home in the families. But I would also like to mention that it's not always easy. I think about I mentioned this because there is also a history and you need to remember that there is a history if you are going forward. When I was a young woman, I was in the 20s trying to enter politics. There were very old respect, uh, re, uh, respective party colleague, a man. He was a very nice person, but to be kind to me, he told me, should you really enter politics? It's very difficult. Think about yourself. Think about your children. Think about your husband. Don't go to politics because it's so difficult. I listened to him and then I decided if it's that difficult, I need to enter politics because there need to be women as well. And I think 
it's important to be aware about the circumstances in the society, but also to give the possibilities for women and see that women contribute to a better society if we get the possibility to be active. And we can do so if we take the opportunity. Uh, democracies can prosper only if women and men are given equal opportunities in all aspects of our work and private lives. And I would also like to extend my appreciation to Ms. Sonia Palmieri, the international expert who worked hard to put together this guide. And in the OSCE PA, we value our cooperation with experts in all areas of our work, including on gender, not only because of their expertise, but also because working towards gender equality, uh, and that requires of a whole uh, of society approach, encompassing the meaningful engagement of all social actors, governments, parliaments, civil societies, organizations, academia, and the general public. And I would like to add one more thing. In the parliament, there is a lot of things that can be done in my parliament, for example, and I know it's in several others as well. There is childcare, not for regular basis, but if there is a certain moment where it's needed to have a daycare early in the morning, late in the evening, or if the kids can't go to the ordinary childcare, there is the opportunity in the parliament. But it's also about the culture, voting time. For example, to have voting time uh, fluent, it's very difficult. We have fixed voting time. And it's a good practice, not only for women, also for women, because we can as parliamentarians, uh, we are owning our time by this. We know when we need to be in the, the plenary to vote. That's one thing also to promote gender. But I would like to say also the need of role role models. And for me, I would like to give my personal gratitude to Dr. Heidi Fry, the OSE PA Special Representative on Gender Issues, for her restless efforts and commitments to gender equality. And for me, she is a role model. When I was new in OSE PA, I took part in one of her gender lounges and listened to uh, Dr. Heidi Fry. It was a true pleasure because her energy, her energy, us, it was amazing. And she gave a lot of, uh, uh, what should I say, also the possibility to get together, to build network. And that's another important thing. And uh, I would like to say that it would be very interesting to listen to Dr. Heidi Frey today and her knowledge and uh, her commitments. But finally, I would like to thank uh, UDIR and OSCE PA staff who have organized this important event. And I wish you all a very fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you for these introductory words, uh, President Satterfeld. And thank you so much again for waking up this early uh, to attend our event live. Um, dear Sasha, would you like to introduce our next speaker now? Indeed, uh, Hannah, we have really the, uh, the privilege, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, to have uh, Audir's first deputy uh, director, Katarina Riabico, uh, to address you in the name of the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and um, Human um, Rights. Uh, Katya, Katarina, a true leader for gender equality in our um, office. Dear Katya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha. I really see that the expectations have grown. Thank you for this uh, uh, and thank you for setting it so high. Um, I, um, I really do have a, a true pleasure uh, to be here uh, today with, with all of you. I would like to thank the Madam President for the Warm welcome to all participants and also for recognizing the longstanding cooperation between the OEC ODIR and the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, as uh, this is not the first uh, avenue where we are joining, combining our voices, strengthening the, the volume, uh, speaking in promotion, in support of gender equality. And this is of extreme importance to our both institutions uh, for which I'm personally very grateful. 
Um, however, I also like to echo the words um, of, um, of Hannah and uh, Madam President as well, as um, you know that this, the work on the guide has been a, a long journey and uh, we started working on it way before the uh, 24th of February. And uh, now we are conducting this meeting on the backdrop of the very real, way too real military attack by the Russian Federation in Ukraine. And it's indeed causing an enormous human suffering impacting the now already millions of civilians um, in Ukraine and those who fled the country um, and uh, now finding their refuge uh, in the neighboring countries. And uh, ODIR has been using its voice uh, and mandate uh, not only to monitor the violations of human rights and the international humanitarian law um, as the military attack was progressing, but we also spoke on the impact of the armed conflict on the functioning of democratic institutions. And this is of continuous importance to highlight uh, that aspect of our mandate, uh, the, uh, the functioning of democratic institutions, but also to recognize the work of women parliamentarians in Ukraine and in other countries across the OECPA who are now relentlessly working to reestablish peace. And I really like to salute uh, the women parliamentarians in particular for their commitment and for their courage, courage and for using their voices uh, in, um, uh, in the peace efforts and, uh, uh, and in trying to end this armed conflict as soon as possible. And um, this only is an evidence that ODIR needs to continue to exercise its mandate and to continue speaking as loud, as clear as possible in support of the promotion of human rights, democratic institutions and gender equality in particular. And this is indeed the topic of this meeting today. Um, we know, and uh, Madam President mentioned it, that women have been present in parliamentary chambers across uh, modern democracies for over a century now. And um, while rarely constituting a majority, women's participation has become increasingly common in these institutions, the institutions of representative democracy. And um, it's taking great political mobilization, most often by women themselves. And I think that uh, Madam President herself and also the special representative, uh, Dr. Heidi Fry, set a great example on showing how this mobilization uh, um, of women has been taking place and uh, how the, the women been playing a role model and serving as role models for other women um, uh, for that to be a success. And um, we see region in general um, in the advancing in the representation of women across the parliaments of its uh, 57 participating states um, has seen a progress, but we all know, I think, and it's that unfortunately this progress has been really uneven uh, for many different reasons. And as we speak, women's representation ranges from nearly parity to as little or as little as 15%. And the regional average has now reached 30%, which from one hand, it can be a good news. Uh, however, the global average is still 26. We can debate whether it's too, too much or too little. However, we all, I think, can agree in this room that we are striving, we need to continue striving for parity, for gender parity. And um, what I'd like to say also that as elected women enter parliaments in large numbers, the call to transform this institution from within is getting really louder. And ODIR stands ready to support the institutions as they go through this transformation. And it is very vital to enable this meaningful participation of women in peace and parliamentary staff, very importantly, parliamentary staff as well, in all the internal processes in the lawmaking and the parliamentary oversight processes. And of course, is it a task for me when women only? We probably say no, because it's very important to have male leaders uh, working side by side with women leaders and playing a key role in this transformation. And of course, we have a lot of questions uh, how they see this process, how they see this transformation, and whether they are actually listening to the women voices as these changes are taking place. 
And uh, are they reaching for old bias and stereotypes or they are ready to transform themselves and uh, really truly stand uh, hand by hand with women leaders uh, as the, towards a political system that would serve everyone in our societies across the OEC participating states. And I'm really happy to report to all of you that Odir is supporting parliaments in this transformation and really challenging male leaders in answering and in demanding answers to the questions that, that I just raised. And uh, be it uh, through collecting good practices and lessons learned or producing practical guides like the one that uh, we will be hearing about today or through other avenues uh, that on joint work with the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly or other institutions that all put together a holistic, holistic approach that helps us in really trying to achieve an even success uh, across OSCE participating states. And of course, over the last two debates, we've worked with dozens of uh, parliamentary chambers helping the parliaments across the OEC to set up alliances of women MPs, providing legislative reviews and law of laws, uh, conducting gender audits of parliaments and uh, supporting them in developing par uh, parliamentary gender action plans. And I saw Honorable Meg Mann uh, here in the audience who's been really supportive of that work in many OEC participating states. And uh, in the last three years, we worked with parliaments from Western Europe through Balkans to Central Asia, on all of these issues, and we're really looking forward to continue this work in the future. I'll probably conclude here because I'm really looking forward to the presentation of our distinguished speakers. And I would like to say again that um, on behalf of Odir and on behalf of uh, Odir Director Matteo Mikaci, I, I would like to express gratitude to all of the national parliaments that have contributed to this publication, 46 national parliaments, from all parts of the OEC region, including North America, Europe, Central Asia, have provided the input, enabling this learning and exchange far beyond national borders. And, and I think that this is already a success by itself. And I would like to congratulate uh, all of us uh, in achieving this success. And uh, finally, I'd again like to reiterate our big thanks to the OEC Parliamentary Assembly for being a reliable and long-standing uh, partner, project partner, and uh, recognize that without your contributions and inspiration, this process would have not been uh, such a success. I'd like to stop here, and I'd like to wish all of us uh, a fruitful event, interesting and challenging discussions, and uh, finding answers to some of the questions that, uh, that would help us to achieve gender equality in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, dear uh, Katya, dear Katarina, uh, for the strong and encouraging, encouraging uh, words. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to move now to the presentation of Odi's latest guide titled Realizing Gender Equality in Parliament. In 2020 and 2021, Odir and the OSCPA had the privilege to work with one of the leading feminist researchers in the world, Dr. Sonia Palmieri from the Australian National University. Um, as a result uh, of this cooperation, this fantastic guide has been produced. Dear Sonia, it is a privilege having you today with us directly from Canberra, Australia. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, OSCE and ODR friends, uh, excellencies and honourable members, um, it's a delight, it's a pure delight to be uh, presenting this uh, guide on realising gender equality in Parliament. Uh, it is absolutely the product of a truly wonderful collaboration, a collaboration which I'm so proud of and which is really between the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights and a very diverse range of stakeholders. Um, I'd really like to first acknowledge the gender team at ODEA, um, not only for asking me to join them on this quite long but very important journey, um, but for their kindness and their generosity 
And in particular, a huge thank you to you, dear Sasha, uh, for stewarding this report, this guide, um, sometimes through difficult waters, but always with a calm sense of care. Um, I'd also really like to thank the many peer reviewers um, who are both from academia, but also from the field, directly in the field, the practitioners, which I think speaks to an expanding network of gender sensitive parliament experts. And I am so grateful to be a part of that network. In this project, I think uh, ODEA and OSE had a singular vision. They wanted to create a bespoke guide, a product to support their parliaments in becoming more gender sensitive. I hope my friends at ODEA won't be too upset when I say I think it had a much larger reach. This is a guide which has helped us to continue to understand and refine our understanding of what it is to be gender sensitive, of what it means for parliaments when we say this is what gender sensitivity looks like. And if I could just uh, share my screen, which I forgot to do before, yeah, I'll, I'll just note that this guide is the first to use a rather different definition a new definition of what gender sensitive parliaments are. And that definition is that a gender sensitive parliament values and prioritizes gender equality as a social, economic, and political objective. And it reorients and transforms a parliament's institutional culture, processes, and practices, and outputs towards these objectives. Why is this new definition important? Well, for me, it's important because it strategically links gender equality to gender sensitive parliaments. So gender equality isn't just a byproduct of the work that we're encouraging parliaments to do. It is the central goal. It is the driving motivation. Gender sensitivity, gender, gender equality is achieved through concerted and continuous action, through institutional mechanisms and policies, yes, but always driven by a culture that values and recognises that gender equality benefits everybody. So this guide specifically supports the achievement of gender equality in three of Parliament's key functions, representation, lawmaking and of course oversight. But before I get into that, I just want to give a quick overview about how the guide was produced. This guide is essentially the product of a survey that was distributed to all parliamentary chambers between December 2020 and March 2021. Uh, so it does seem like a long time ago, um, but it really and deliberately drew on the similar kinds of questions that had been used in surveys by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Assembly Association, sorry, and the Interparliamentary Union. Um, and so it was important for us to be able to monitor progress, and that's why we drew on those questions. And in many respects, this guide has been able to give a kind of a longitudinal perspective, what has happened in parliaments, in the OSCE region at least, in the last 10 years, which is the last time a major large scale research project had been undertaken. As has been said by others already this evening, we received responses from 52 chambers across 46 of the OSCE participating states. So that's a really strong response rate. We got responses uh, from parliaments with very diverse representation of women from some of the highest, um, and the OSCE region does boast um, parliaments with gender parity, to those, of course, who have a little bit less, around the 15% mark, which is, which is still better than some of the worst parliaments in the world. So the OSCE region is doing quite well. We also drew um, 
we, we kind of probed a little bit further in the case of 10 parliaments. So using their responses to the survey, we identified that 10 parliaments in particular had done some really fantastic work in relation to new rules of procedure on gender balanced leadership, for example, in the case of Montenegro, in the way in which Albania, for example, had formalised its women's caucus in the rules of the parliament, uh, the way in which the parliament of Georgia had trialled gender impact assessments and so forth. So there are 10 in-depth case studies that are also outlined in the, in the guide. Moving then to gender sensitive representation. So we used five different ways of understanding representation. The first is a fairly obvious one. We looked at the membership of the parliaments and the leadership of the parliaments. As, um, as has been said earlier, um, obviously the positions are really important. We also looked at representation across parliamentary committees. We looked at the way in which parliaments are monitoring that presence and participation. We looked at family friendly parliaments, the extent to which parliaments are able to support their members, um, men, women, non-binary members in balancing work and family. And finally, we looked at this emerging issue and an emerging critical issue around violence-free parliaments. So what did we find? Well, in terms of parliamentary membership and leadership, we found that, yes, men are clearly more likely to hold senior roles. Women continue to be more likely to hold the deputy role. So it's not that women are absent from senior leadership entirely, it's just that they're always second in command or more likely to be second in command. In terms of parliamentary committees, we see very little change over the last 10 years since, again, the IPU did its report. Um, women still tend to constitute the majority of parliamentary committees when those committees are looking at what we call the soft portfolio areas, so gender equality, health, education. When it comes to defence, when it comes to economics or budgets and finance, we tend not to see committees that have female majorities. In terms of monitoring presence and participation, which, as I said before, is a way of tracking and then reporting and, in, and then kind of instigating change where there is insufficient presence and participation, we see very few parliaments actually monitoring this. So this is clearly an area for more work. On family-friendly parliaments, we do see changes, particularly in terms of infrastructure. More parliaments have childcare centres. More parliaments have family-friendly rooms. Um, what we don't see, however, is a financial support from the parliament. So parliaments are less likely to support members with some kind of subsidy to enable families to travel together or to be together. On the new emerging issue of violence-free parliaments, I don't mean to say it's only just happening, it's just new and emerging because of the Me Too movement and its clear application to parliaments around the world. We see that we have new inquiries being established um, more regularly. And that is critical because it recognises that there is a problem. And in some parliaments, we see some rule changes, like, for example, the institution of codes of conduct. This is clearly not enough, but it is a start. Turning now to the issue of gender sensitive lawmaking. Well, when we looked at this, we tried to capture the extent to which parliaments are using gender impact analysis and sex desegregated data. We looked at the kinds of relationships that parliaments are forging with gender experts. Again, as was said very well earlier this evening, sorry, today, um, 
Uh, yes, we do want to have those relationships with gender experts. But we also were interested in, do parliaments have gender expertise in-house? Do they have them as part of the parliamentary staff or as part of the political staff? What did we find? In terms of gender impact analysis and use of data, we see actually that there is some gender sensitization through consultation. So it's common that a parliament will seek some uh, advice on, on a kind of uh, on the gender impact of a particular piece of legislation. It doesn't mean that they're doing that by using checklists or tools. So that's less common. What we tend to see is a kind of an ad hoc, um, let's see if someone has any ideas about this particular piece of legislation. And that kind of leads me to the point around stakeholder relationships. Yes, there is engagement with experts and that is wonderful. It is not formalised. It is often informal. And so that means that if it's not a formalised relationship, it's, 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 um, it's, there is potential for this not to apply across all legislation. And in fact, I think parliaments tend to think, well, if, if I need to contact the gender expert, wouldn't I just do that on gender related legislation? But we are, of course, trying to mainstream gender equality as a kind of a principle that underlies all legislation. And so if parliaments aren't using tools in a systematic way, that just cannot happen. On the question of in-house gender expertise, so to what extent do parliaments have um, someone who can say, have you considered this aspect of the legislation? Have you contacted these people? The response was, well, that doesn't seem to be applicable uh, to our parliament. And so that's a really interesting finding. Um, parliaments, if they are to drive gender equality through all of their work, have to have the kinds of expertise built in to their, to their working um, workforce. On the oversight, we looked at the way in which parliamentary bodies are focused on gender equality, and then we looked at this idea of how is gender mainstreaming an oversight tool. Um, in terms of the what kinds of bodies usually work on gender equality, we found that, of course, there are dedicated gender equality and human rights committees, but and they are responsible for looking at some aspects of oversight from a gender perspective. It's very rarely the case, and, of, and we know already that the case of Sweden is the exception, that this is done across all parliamentary committees. What we also found, though, which I think is interesting, is that formal women's caucuses are very likely to, are very unlikely to be driving gender-sensitive oversight. So that doesn't seem to be part of their remit, their responsibility. When we look at the question of gender mainstreaming as oversight, I was interested to know why, what is the general purpose? What is the point of gender mainstreaming? When parliaments are, are saying, yes, yes, we do the gender mainstreaming, what are they really finding? And this was fascinating to me. Often the purpose is unclear. So they're not really sure why they're doing gender mainstreaming. And often they think it's to, to identify whether there is a need to support more women in, the, in, in terms of their numbers. Should there be more women in leadership? Should there be more women participating in this particular area, in this sector? We're not seeing gender mainstreaming as a mechanism to see whether there are safety and security concerns um, across men, women, and non-binary people. We're not seeing gender mainstreaming as a kind of a process by which we might identify economic disadvantage. So we're just still seeing gender mainstreaming as a process of understanding whether or not there are sufficient numbers of women. And this, I think, is also something that we could do some more work on. So that, of course, leads us to the, the kind of the purpose of the guide, which is how can we help parliaments? 
And in that, the, 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 the kind of the, I think the kind of the key innovation of this particular guide are three infographics, which I'm very, very grateful to our friends at ODEA for having devised. The first is around gender sensitive representation. And we've identified five key things that really should happen to improve gender sensitive representation. In the first instance, we just have to see an outlawing of discriminatory and sexist behavior. We just need to have parliaments acknowledge a zero tolerance for this kind of behavior. It can be through codes of conduct, but it can also be through informal mechanisms. There also clearly needs to be a mechanism by which to address complaints of sexism because we are seeing so many more of them and we will continue to see more of them, I think, in light of the Me Too movement. Parliaments clearly need to work on work-life balance. Uh, this is obviously a particularly hard issue for parliaments, but if they're going to attract a more diverse and a more gender-balanced um, cohort of members of parliament, we clearly need to have better balance in their work and life, and not just for MPs, but also for staff. One way of doing that, I think, is to think about sharing, sharing leadership, sharing participation. And finally, if we're going to have parliaments that value gender equality, they need to prioritise gender equality as a topic of debate. They need to ensure that gender equality isn't some kind of marginalised topic, that it is a central way of addressing every single kind of issue. Um, and I think deliberately prioritising gender equality debates would be one way of doing that. On gender sensitive lawmaking and oversight, four key things to do. And again, it starts with a mandate. <laughs> I often think parliaments are reluctant to do something unless they're told to do it. And so that's why a mandate is important. But it also requires capacity. MPs and parliamentary staff need the skills. And they're, I think they're crying out for training and more kind of capacity building um, to undertake comprehensive, deep gender analysis. As I said before, we're not seeing a lot of formalised relationships with gender experts and women's civil society organisations, and so I think formalising that is really important. But also equipping and, and giving MPs and staff the data, the right kinds of data to do this is critical. And finally, just before I end, I just want to say, this, this guide has really helped to crystallise the idea of gender sensitive parliaments being a continuous process. So it doesn't end. <laughs> I think it's clear that we don't have gender equality in any country. UN Women have been talking about this for at least the last, I think since 2010, since they were established. So that's a, a good decade or more. There is there is a need to do more. And in the parliamentary context, this means it's a continuous process. You start by some kind of assessment. There's no reason not to do an assessment given the plethora of tools that exist, uh, whether they're by OSCE or the OECD or the IPU or the CPA or the European Institute for Gender Equality. There are plenty of tools out there. So there's really no excuse not to undertake a gender sensitivity assessment as far as I'm concerned. The point of that has to be to create an action plan, some kind of policy that is then resourced and then reviewed, and then you start again. With that, Sasha, I want to thank you for allowing me a little bit of extra time. Um, I'm very happy to stay on the line and, of course, take any questions if there are any. Thank you, dear Dr. Palmieri, also from my side. And uh, thank you for all the wonderful work you have done on producing this guide. I'm sure it will be very useful for the parliaments across the OSCE region as well. Um, after your interesting presentation, I would suggest that we move straight to the parliamentary discussion on this important issue. 
Uh, we have three passionate speakers to introduce us to the parliamentary perspective of realizing gender equality. Um, the first panelist is Dr. Hedy Fry from Canada, who I think needs very little introduction. As our dear President Sederfeld said, um, Dr. Fry is famous for her work uh, on different uh, fields focusing on women's um, equality, social policy, arts and culture, uh, the rights of LGBT community, and so on. She was appointed as the OACPA Special Representative on Gender Issues already in October 2010, and she has been reappointed in the following years. She also ser serves as the longest serving female member of the Canadian Parliament. Um, dear Dr. Fry, the floor is yours, and thank you again for connecting from Vancouver, I believe. Uh, we are today bringing together people from Vancouver all the way to Australia and uh, due to time difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this early uh, in Canada. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. And um, I just wanted to say, it's, I don't know whether it's this early or this late because it's about, <clears throat> it's about 2 a.m. in the morning here. So I don't know really whether we're early or we're late. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, that it was very interesting. Thank you for putting this together. Um, I think the, the, the guide that we're looking at that's been put together uh, and the survey that has been done of parliaments uh, is going to be a really important tool in getting us to move forward. Uh, as a gender, um, as a the gender representative for the OSCE, before I move any further, I wanted to remind everyone about my action plan that I put forward in 2021 to actually talk about an appeal to act. In other words, we talk a lot about gender, but we never do the actions. We sort of tend to talk vaguely of plans, et cetera. And I think today, what we just heard um, from uh, Dr. Palmieri, it tells us that we are beginning to act. We're actually beginning to do concrete stuff, analyze concrete uh, work that is being done and actually audit some of the work that is being done. So this is a good move forward because I think we're finding that when we want to talk about representation of women in parliaments, I think we can see that what from 48% uh, in Sweden uh, to 13% in some of other, uh, our other OSCE states, that we do not have a balance across the region, that there are some places that are doing extremely well and some places that are not. And so the idea is to get this gender sensitivity in all parliaments within the OSCE. And I think, again, one of the things we're finding, though, that since COVID has come about, that we're seeing that Many women are being hard hit by, the, by the, the virus in terms of work, in terms of being able to move forward. They're locked in at home in many instances, they're burned out. Um, and so we also find that what is moving women away from wanting to go into parliaments. And, and I think recently we saw that in the United Kingdom uh, election, that in fact, a lot of women didn't want to run. And this is because of the fact that we are seeing a great deal on social media of threats against women parliamentarians, uh, female women parliamentarians have not only threatened themselves, but there is threat starting with stereotyping, ugly stories and nasty names being called, even to threats of rape. And we have seen some members of parliament in the United Kingdom and in the United States whose lives have been threatened. So, and have actually been, been um, actually the victim of real threats. So what we're seeing is that, that, that uh, women are not wanting to come forward. They're, they're hanging back again. They're, they're going back to a regression period. And I think we need to deal with that and we need to look again, as, as we heard earlier on, that parliaments need to be a safe place. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, I, I just wanted to jump to Canada because recently we have seen this threat and we have acted against it in that the parliament itself is looking at ways of at home, at the offices, in the constituency and in Ottawa of not only protecting women, but protecting all parliamentarians with protective mechanisms in their homes, et cetera, to make sure that these threats are not actually realized. 
So I think there was that place. But then Parliament itself, when you get there, must be safe. And we know that a lot of women don't want to go to Parliament uh, because it isn't safe, because colleagues uh, discriminate against them, because there are sexist, uh, uh, rude side jokes made about women, the tenure of their voices, that they speak too loudly, that they speak too high, their, their voices are squeaky. All this kind of thing that tends to denigrate women's role in Parliament. And I think we need to, to deal with how we as parliamentarians deal with encouraging women to run and when they arrive in Parliament, recognising that they are in a safe place, that they are collegial with all of the other members of Parliament who have got their backs and who respect them and show respect in places like Parliament. So I think we've got a lot of ways to go to get women to want to run again. There has been a, a regression since COVID. And I think that, and, and then the general threats in terms of new right-wing um, governments in many parts of the world that are threatening women's participation in anything at all. And so I think we need to look at that and try to fix that in terms of a general environmental safety mechanism. I think you, what you've heard and, and, the, and the wonderful graphs you've seen from Dr. Palmieri tells us quite generally what we need to do. But I think um, tools are, are the most important thing that we need to look at. And I just wanted to point to not only my plan of action, which is available for anybody in the Parliamentary Assembly to read, uh, it's there, it's part of the Parliamentary Assembly, but to talk about real movements forward, not only legislation, but tools and uh, policies and programs that will actually move the issue of gender equality in Parliament. So I just wanted to point quickly to what has happened in Canada. When I was Minister for, for, for Gender Equality back in, in the day, back in 1996, I had gone to Beijing, and, and I want to refer back. Everyone thinks that it's, it's wonderful uh, that what, about what Beijing began in terms of women's rights, but I always think it's kind of sad. Then in 1995, we finally decided that women's rights were human rights. I think that that was something that is shocking and should be shocking to all of us. But since then, 27 years ago, we have not made the kind of progress we had expected to make in terms of national parliaments globally listening to the Beijing Declaration and moving, moving forward to make the realization of, of gender equality in parliaments uh, 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 an actual fact. We've seen us moving forward and then rolling back and moving forward and then rolling back. And I think so maybe what we need is, is, is an action plan with teeth. And I think this document that Dr. Manberry is talking about looks like it has teeth. In Canada, when, when I was a minister, one of the first things we did in 1996 was bring forward something called gender-based analysis, which meant that we looked at the reality of how policies, legislation, uh, programs, um, taxation, and a lot of areas affected the ability of men and women to achieve some form of equity within, within our society. And so that started then. Every department was not mandated to do gender-based analysis on their work, but many departments were encouraged to do it. Today, the, all those years later, we're now seeing that in the parliament in Canada, it is a part of what every department must do. We now bring in gender budgeting and we have, an, uh, you know, that gender budgeting looks at how budgets are impacting, again, the gender. And I, and I think so, so there are a lot of tools that can be moving forward. We talked about codes of conduct to make Parliament safe. Again, uh, the Parliament in Canada has moved forward with creating codes of conduct in terms of how MPs relate to each other, either sexual misconduct or other areas of misconduct, looking at how, um, how staff, um, in the parliamentary precinct are treated. And of course, there is an independent body that now looks at complaints that is not within parliament itself, but it is part of, of an independent body that looks at complaints, assesses them, and then takes steps to do something about them. So that is creating a safer place for parliament. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is in 2015, when our government, when we became government, um, the most important thing in creating gender equity in Parliament is political will. And our Prime Minister then said in 2015, the day he got elected, that he is going to make sure that the, the cabinet 
of Parliament. In other words, the decision-making body, executive body of his government are going to be 50% women, even if we do not have 50% of women actually elected. In fact, in the Canadian Parliament, it's a, it's a little over 30.5%. It's kind of the, the, the OSCEPA average. But still, what we now have, and I would, I, I'm just very proud to boast about this, is our deputy prime minister or a vice prime minister, whatever you want to call it, is a woman. The, the woman is also a finance minister, is a woman. We have the defense minister who is a woman, the foreign affairs minister who is a woman, and the Department of Gender Equity uh, minister is also a woman. So there are, there's a lot of movement forward, but it, that was political will. Prime ministers tend to decide who their cabinet's going to be, and that political will was very, very important. But I think, speaking to what Dr. Palmieri said, the importance is that we've got to move forward and we've got to put these into place. The second part of it is that as parliaments um, look at, you talked about committees, I think the important thing is to again have women in decision making processes in committees and to look at how we have equal representation on committees, uh, of, of a balance of gender, but also look at how we have chairs of committees that are, that are going to be, uh, again, a woman, to look forward to seeing how we bring good public policy making. I think those are some of the things that we need to start actually doing. And I think we need to start auditing what's going on. I know it sounds as if there's a big stick and the big brother is watching, but you know, if we're going to realize what we have, what we have to do to ensure that actual women participate fully in the decision making with regard to the economic, political, social, and cultural lives of our nations, then we have to make this step forward. And I was also pleased to see uh, you know, Dr. Palmieri talking about gender being non-binary. This is something in Canada that we cease with, that the idea that gender is not necessarily always male and female. And most of the gender-based analysis that we did back in 1996, when I was minister, was binary. It was about looking at the reality of the lives of males and the reality of the lives of females. And our data gathering was with regard to male and female participation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, within the, the political, economic, and cultural and social life of the country. But we've moved forward now to, to not talking about gender as being binary anymore, because we know that it isn't. And I think this is something that we need to turn our minds to, albeit the fact that we have not achieved gender parity within the OSCE region the way we're supposed to, we need to start to also talking about non-binary uh, issues. And so I think, you know, the idea that in Canada we face some real challenges, though. Canada is the second largest country in the world. And to come to the federal national parliament, women and men have to leave, travel often eight hours to travel across the country from the west to the east in order to go to the parliament parliament itself. And that means that they're away from families for large periods of time. And for, the, for women, this is a big issue. And so I, I listened to, to President Sederfeld talk about issues like childcare. Childcare is important if women are going to participate fully in the economic life, not only of the country, but in parliaments as large as ours and as far distant as ours. There needs to be good, solid ability to have childcare or to have sharing of childcare by both parts, uh, the parties in, in, a, in a relationship and in a marriage. And so these are some of the kinds of policies we need to talk about. I know that we passed a lot of legislation recently within Canada to talk about this kind of equity, to talk about, um, you know, the, the, we brought in the D Department of Gender Equality, Women and Gender Equality Act, meaning that we're talking about non-binary as well. And we talked about the Canada Gender Budgeting Act, which is now undertaken by the female um, finance minister who is insisting on doing it on everything that she does. And I think the idea that we need to have gender representation in parliament is because parliaments in any democracy needs to be representative of its people. And that means the diversity of people. And that means we don't only need to talk about binary and non-binary. We need to talk about the intersectionality of representation of gender in parliament because gender is not a simple one-way street. We have various people who are actually minority groups who are not as well represented and who are discriminated and who tend to be at the bottom of the ladder in our country. That 
that includes indigenous people. We look at, again, we see LGBTQ persons. These are the kinds of things that we need to do as we look across the board at that kind of intersectionality. So it's not a simple sum game in which we just go like, okay, let's count the number of men and women, collect data, suggest what it's doing, look at how they're faring and fix it. That isn't the only way of dealing with it, not just with legislation policies, etc. We also need to reach out and involve civil society in legislation, decision making of policies and programs. And we need to fund, governments need to actually fund civil society to be able to advocate and to do the work that they need to do on the ground in the field. And so these are some of the things that must be done in parliaments. I think those are some of the things that we are beginning to do in our parliament in Canada. But we have a long way to go. But the, the idea at the end of the day is that we, when we have representation of the diversity of the people, either gender or binary, non-binary, or all of that intersectionality, we need to know that this is because we will have better representation we will have better decision making because we will have people from all across our nation knowing and understanding the issues that, they, that their communities face, the issues that their, their publics face, and be able to start working on them. Also, we know that anatomically, physiologically, and in many other ways, enough work now is being done to show that psychologically women approach problem solving, uh, see, see uh, challenges very differently and problem solve them very differently. So when we have, you know, men, women and non-binary gender working together, we are getting the best of, of a 360 degree look at how we can make a difference to the lives of the people that we serve. And so it's really an important piece of understanding why, why gender. And, you know, so I, I just wanted to pull that together and to say that, that there was work to be done, but the first step was taken here by what we heard from Dr. Palmieri and by, by, by Odir uh, for moving forward to getting the real teeth into the real substantive concrete efforts that we must make. Now, the OSCPA has to move forward to start looking at our uh, 57 nation states and seeing how they managed to do this. And before I close, I want to say how important at this time it is, not only to think of what COVID taught us, but what is happening in Ukraine right now, where the people that are fleeing, the people that are leaving their homes, the people who are at greatest risk in terms of not ever seeing their families again are women and children that are fleeing as refugees and how we protect those women and children uh, from, uh, from exploitation, from trafficking and from all the other risks that they face alone uh, and while, you know, quote unquote, the, the men stay back and fight. I think the bottom line is that this is a very risky time for Ukrainian women and their children. And I think we need to Think about humanitarian aid, and we need to be absolutely certain to make sure that their human rights are recognized. So uh, that's all I have to say, because I would like to, to, to have more time for us to discuss this and to do a question and answer bit. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Thank you a lot uh, for sharing the experience um, from, from Canada, from the developments in the OSC Parliamentary Assembly in your function as special representative but also for reminding us on their, in a way, intersection of, of these developments with, with um, the current uh, global challenges um, with, with the war um, in, in Ukraine and, and um, COVID uh, pandemic and post-pandemic developments. We are now moving to our next uh, uh, speaker, Honorable Clotilda Bushka member of the parliament of Albania and uh, chair of the one of the key committees in the parliament, the, the uh, uh, committee who is in charge for legislative um, um, affairs. Uh, the parliament of Albania has been one of the first parliaments in, in Southeast Europe um, and Eastern Europe to apply the gender sensitive parliaments approach. Uh, by conducting uh, gender as assessments in the parliament and by working on parliamentary gender action plans. Uh, dear uh, Clotilda Bushka, we are looking forward to hearing from your uh, lessons, uh, uh, from your experience, your lessons learned, and from uh, the challenges that are of, uh, potentially still present in your, in your parliamentary house. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. Um, it's a very great pleasure to be here 
with all the participants that are sensitive on gender issues. We have um, had indeed a lot of um, cooperation with OSCE presence in Albania and all of the achievements, I might say, that the Albanian parliament has done so far. Um, OSCE has been present with its expertise and uh, with the uh, knowledge that we uh, didn't have in order to help us in having uh, these results. Indeed, I had prepared something to say, but listening to the previous speakers, uh, I'll skip that speech and I'll talk uh, due to the topics that I heard the previous participants. Um, so I would thank all of the organizers for putting all this uh, together. Uh, Madam President of, uh, of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, all the uh, speakers that had the floor until now, and Miss, uh, Mrs. Palmieri, whose presentation was of great values, and it reminded me that how much we have achieved is just the first step. We need to go further in order to improve the work. Well, achieving a parliament that it's gender sensitive, it's not an easy task. I think all of us can understand that. It's not uh, just an event only, it's a struggle, I might say. The struggle begins with a society which should be uh, more open to understand and to accept the equality between men and women. And then it has to be transformed into the policy decision-making. Well, so far after more than 20 years in Albania of a movement for gender equality, I can be proud of telling you some figures which are not uh, what we really um, need as a, uh, to say that this is a great success, but it can be considered as a very good um, step forward. In the Albanian government, we have 12 ministers. Uh, there are only five men. All the others are women. So we have not a gender balance because women uh, number, it's uh, bigger in the Albanian government. If we go to the parliament, we have 140 members, uh, 50 of which are women. And this is the first uh, legislature in which we have reached the quota of 30%. Um, we have seven uh, permanent uh, committees in the parliament four of which are leaded by women. I am one of them, and I do chair one of the most important committees in the parliament, which uh, takes uh, care on legislative framework, human rights and public administration, including local authority. Foreign affairs, social issues, um, European integration are leaded by women in the parliament. When there is a man that is leading the committee, there is the vice chairperson that is woman from the other, uh, from the other uh, gender. Do you hear me okay? Do you hear me correctly? Okay, thank you. Because we have sometimes uh, like blurring the camera, so I'm happy that you can hear me. Uh, continuing with this, I'd like to tell you that uh, we have a special subcommittee in the Albanian parliament, which take care for gender uh, equality issues and for the monitoring of all the legal and uh, institutional um, measures to protect women from domestic and from gender violence. And this is a special mechanism created in the past legislature, so let's say five years ago, in order to be more focused on uh, various issues, including how our parliament is a gender sensitive. Having said that, I want to stress that it's not just a cause to have more women into parliament. The importance of having more women in parliament is to empower these women to be um, leading all the actions for making the parliament more equal and for fighting for equality in the society. In the society. So to say it in short terms, how can 
women that are in politics and in power help other women and the society to be a better place for all of the citizens. So this is the purpose of it. And with this in mind, we have done all of our actions uh, in the work as women and peace, but in cooperation, of course, with men and peace. I am one of those who have fought for gender equality in Albania, but I never thought that this is a war of women. This is a war and this is a struggle of all the society because uh, half of the society is women, half of the society is men. That's why all, they sh all of them should be represented and all the voices should be heard and all the needs should be addressed. So we cannot just segregate into gender, but we need to try to create synergies together. And I'm happy that year in year, the, we, the men MPs have been very much cooperative. At the beginning, we have had a lot of problems and the problem started in the political parties that do present the candidates for those who will be the future parliamentarians. They need to be convinced that a gender quota is important. They need to agree what is this gender quota. Some people do defend the idea of uh, meritocracy. So when we talk for women in politics, everybody talks on meritocracy. When we talk for men in politics, nobody asks what is the merit of a man. That's why uh, I have had always an argument saying that, of course, this has to be a merit-based process. Who said that putting a gender quota will not be respected, the merit-based principle? And this has to be respected for both men and women. And then we don't have to forget that the situation of women, it's not uh, the same in every area. We have cities that are developed like capital cities or bigger cities that do have opportunities for both men and women to compete in fair uh, ways. But there are other areas in which women do not have these uh, opportunities. They have a lot of other challenges starting from the mentality to uh, other uh, problems. That's why we need to provide mechanisms in the law in order to um, enable uh, women and men to have equal chances in these processes. We, having in mind these challenges, have tried to make a um, strategy, which is now um, approved by the parliament, for some years, the strategy uh, is about how to make the parliament more gender sensitive and how to streamline gender equality in all our work. This strategy is currently being um, implemented and it, it is focused in four main areas. The one and the first uh, most important for me is how to empower women MPs to work for making the parliament more gender equality and how to involve many actors in the society in all the legislative processes. The second one is proposing uh, new bills that have streamlined gender equality in their um, um, substance. The third one is how to monitor that these laws that are gender sensitive are being implemented. And the fourth one is how can we create a strong voice in the parliament to make awareness for, for uh, issues that do preoccupy the other women and other parts of the society. In concrete terms, I can tell you that there is a package of at least seven laws that we have approved due to this methodology that uh, is based on the strategy we have and approved in the parliament. Starting from the electoral code in which the quota for participation in the elections is divided in two parts. For the elections in the local authority, we have an obliga obligatory uh, gender equality quota that is 50%. So all those in our municipalities that are elected should elect 50% of the members in the city councils, women, and 50% of them should be men. In the parliament, so in the legislative body, we have the minimum 
gender quota of 30 percent but with the uh, opportunity that is provided in law to go up to 50 percent but it cannot be lower than 30 percent and the mechanism imposes the political parties to um, respect this provision when they do the list for the political candidates then we have uh, continued to work for a package of laws that start from legal aid for marginalized groups when women do have a priority, especially those that are chairs of the family, those who are victims of the uh, domestic violence, those who have a, a low income and that had to be to uh, and they, that they have to be supported by state legal aid, meaning having legal advices for problems that they face, or having a, an attorney at law paid by the state when uh, the case is in a court case, for example. Not only the legal aid, meaning a lawyer, but even the expenses for the expertise needed. For example, in the case of the divorces, women. Uh, do not have uh, funds for psychologists to help kids in order to uh, be convinced where to go with the father or with the mother. This is what we put in the law, that these are costs to be covered by the state. The other law, it's a, a package of law on juvenile justice. Or I can mention here the law for the protection against domestic violence and um, gender uh, violence. This is um, a very good law, which is very much having results. Uh, we have increase of the numbers of the reporting of those that do um, suffer from domestic or gender violence uh, every day. Somebody can take these statistics and in somehow some people do um, analyze as the number of the domestic violence is increased because we see we have uh, more statistics. Indeed, it's not like that. The domestic violence has been there, but we didn't have mechanisms in order to enable women to report the domestic violence because there was not a confidence, not a trust on the legal mechanism, on the institutional mechanism that if this violence is reported, will it have any uh, choice or, is, or a good ending to the victims? That is what we did. We made a new law which provides concrete mechanism for women and for children and for all the um, society members that do suffer such kind of violence to report it and to find the correct answer from the state and protection. And the protection doesn't mean only police protection, but even shelter, social assistance, healthcare system. So I'm, I'm very happy for that piece of legislation because what I'm telling to you, dear ladies and gentlemen, took many years. It's not just one law only. It is a real work that we have done through years to achieve these results. And now we are having the first, uh, let's say, good cases with success, but it's still a process that we cannot stop and we need to improve it. Um, I can mention here as well the law on gender equality. The law on gender equality in Albania, it's old, but it's good. Now we are in a process of making a post-legislative scrutiny on that law in order to see how this law has influenced the society has it helped for a society more gender balanced or no? And I guess we will have very soon a package of amendments on that uh, on that uh, package of, on that law in order to improve and give concrete legal mechanism to people on uh, on on that uh, area. Um, the honorable, the honorable. Uh, I'm concluding. Yes, great, thank you. I'm concluding because I, I, I said you, I, I has skipped my speech because I wanted to be more concrete in giving some yes. detail. I will conclude now by saying two words relating to the situation we have. Um, Albania do has a code of conduct and we have um, mechanisms to address it concretely with measures and penalties. Albania do have obligation in the parliament to have the um, delegation in international organization gender balanced here i want to stop and to express solidarity with ukraine and to invite all of the parliamentarians 
being part in the delegation in international organization to support uh, initiatives that help women in Ukraine. They are suffering many much more that we learn from the news. And we can do something, meaning that in humanitarian action, in all of the organizations that are at international focus, we can do our part. At least we raise awareness. This is not something that we cannot take it seriously. That's why I really and strongly um, want to uh, tell you that all of us need to do something and be active in this process. Since even the Beijing Declaration and Action Plan, women and armed conflict have it as a priority out of 12, we need to show our role. And this is the time we need to do it. Thank you very much to ACO Adir. Thank you for keeping this uh, event together. Um, I'm really impressed for all the work you have done. And I thank, and I want to thank the OSCE presence in Albania for the valuable support it has given to the Albanian parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot for, for your call um, for, of solidarity and concrete action. Uh, thank you also for uh, this inspirational uh, um, presentation uh, that demonstrated that um, if there are critical actors present in a parliament, a parliament can indeed transform Amy that becoming a gender sensitive institution. And it can also then based on this transformation deliver concrete outputs for the benefit of all uh, citizens, all women and men, all girls and boys in all their diversity in a society. Uh, dear uh, participants of this um, event, a kind reminder that you can uh, express your interest for um, um, comments and uh, short statements of up to three minutes um, in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, but before we move to the short Q&A session that we will have, our third and last speaker, uh, dear uh, long-term partner of the OSC and of OSC Audio con con concretely, Madame Meg Megman. Megman is an international expert on gender sensitive parliaments, um, a former UK member of parliament and former um, UK minister. Odir had the privilege to work with Megman over the last uh, uh, few years, among others in 2021 in conducting a participatory gender audit of the Parliament of Malta. Dear Meg, we, we are looking forward to um, hearing uh, from you, uh, from your uh, past uh, political and expert experience. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sasha. And it's a, a great pleasure to be with everybody. It's, um, it's quite cold in, in the UK today, so I've had to put on uh, some something warm, so I haven't uh, got my smart jacket on, but I'm delighted nonetheless to be with you. I'm going to confine my remarks to talking about gender sensitive audits or gender sensitive assessments of parliament. And as uh, my good friend Sonia Palmieri said earlier, there are lots of tools out there and there are now lots of documents. And in essence, building on the document uh, that Sonia has led on, they uh, authored, um, I, I think there are now uh, even more ways in which parliaments can do that assessment. And that audit, that assessment is fundamental to understand the process. As uh, Sasha has said, I was recently involved in an, an audit in, in Malta and delighted to see one of our colleagues from Malta on the call. Um, I've also worked on gender sensitive assessment work in Georgia, in Serbia, and then also in two countries in Af Africa, in Kenya and Djibouti. And again, great to see uh, a, a colleague who's working currently in Djibouti also on this call, uh, bonjour. Um, so uh, I want to talk about the difficulties of undertaking audits. I think the first thing to understand is just what complex organizations parliaments are. Every organization is complex, but in parliament, you've got both the staff, let's not forget about the staff, and great to hear uh, Sonia uh, emphasize that, uh, and you've got the members of parliament. And above all, this is a political institution. We often talk about organizations uh, having 
their politics and in English we'd say politics with a small p. So um, politics about how people interrelate. Well in a parliament you've got that political aspect and you've then got the whole of the politics that is taking place in the country and that needs to be recognised. And one of my frustrations in the work that I've done internationally now for over 12 years is that those who aren't always uh, involved in, in politics try to take the politics out of Parliament, try to take the politics out of the politics. Simply put, you can't. They have to be taken into account. And it needs to be understood when undertaking an audit, if you are the external expert, uh, the facilitator, that there will be things which the members of parliament will instinctively understand about the political environment, which you will have no idea about. So going in with a set of measures that ought to happen, a set of proposals is not the way to do it. It really has to be a bespoke a bespoke process, a process that takes account of what's happening currently within the parliament, but also really importantly, the history. And I think it was Hedy uh, Fry who said earlier that the history is really important, what's gone before. Uh, and then fundamentally, in relation to politics and representation in parliament are the political parties. And this is where it can be quite difficult because you can go into a, a parliament and you can talk to the staff, you can talk about the structures, but underneath all of that are the political parliaments, uh, parties. And in every political party, there are also the politics with a small p. There are also the politics that are going on there. Uh, it's also a competitive environment. It's a competitive environment within parliament, it's a competitive environment within a political party. There are measures that can be taken which are not what we call zero sum games. Everybody can benefit from it. But most of the time, the way that politicians will be looking at this is, is this beneficial to my political party when we're looking at parliament? Is it beneficial to, uh, to me? when we're looking within political parties and all of that has to be understood. Now, this is not to say that people go into politics for their own gain, absolutely not. Most politicians that I know, certainly in my country, regardless of whether they're in my political party or in other political parties, go in there to make a difference because they want to change society, because they want to see things improve. And part of that political, um, issue is that the reason I want my political party to win is because I think we have the better answers to the problems of our society. It's not that I'm undermining the politicians who are in the other political parties. They may equally think they've got the answers. I just disagree with them. So that wanting to win and wanting to have the majority is absolutely normal in a political environment. And one of the things that's been fundamentally crucial to getting greater representation of women in the UK is an understanding that if you've got more women, you're going to do better. And this is one of the things that I say in a lot of political um, uh, environments around the world. The first political party that improves female representation will get a political bounce from this. They will get more people elected. And we have statistics for that. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with that. But I mean, in the UK, uh, the, the Labour Party, my political party, took on this issue 30 years ago. And it's taken 30 years to get the majority of female MPs from the Labour Party being women. So we have over 50% of our members of parliament from the Labour Party are women. But we started in the 1980s with quotas in the party. So that needs to be thought about. Now, overall, the UK doesn't look uh, that wonderful. I think we're at about 34, 35% in parliament. But the differences in the political parties are really stark. And it's really important, therefore, 
in gender assessments, gender audits, to be looking not just at an overall figure, but looking at different aspects. What is one political party doing that's been successful that maybe another political party can learn from? They won't necessarily want to do it in the same way. They don't have the same history. They don't have the same beliefs, but they could learn from that. And that's the same within the staffing units. Are there parts of the parliament that have really made a difference and got lots of women um, in, involved? Can others learn from that? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, once an audit or an assessment's been completed, it's really important to look at this and, and to look at the measures that can be taken. And just as Sonia uh, praised the infographics about the actions that can be taken, this is one of the things that I think is very, very strong within this new document. It tells you what are the different actions that can be taken. Now, those again have to be relevant to the parliament. Some parliaments will feel very ready to take on some of those issues. Setting up, for example, a cross-party women's caucus in some uh, parliaments will be easy. Not going to be easy if you've only got two major political parties. <laughs> it's not going to be easy if one party really sees that women's representation is something that's, that they campaign on that's part of their uh, fundamental being. They're not going to want to give that ground to other people. So, um, which was the case in the UK Parliament, and it's the case in other parliaments I've been in. But if you can get them to think, OK, you're not going to want to have a women's caucus, but maybe you can have other mechanisms for cooperating on individual issues, like setting up a parliamentary group on domestic violence. Most women politicians would sign up to that. There are different ways to do it. So think about that. At the end of an audit, coming up with a gender action plan, you need some quick fixes, some things which are really going to show that Parliament wants to change, wants to do th things differently. But they don't have to be big things. Sometimes they can just set down a marker that Parliament is changing. So childcare, it took, oh, I think, you know, 15 years to get childcare uh, facilities in the UK Parliament. Um, but before that, we had a family room. A family room, something which says Parliament recognises that you as a member of Parliament have family responsibilities, you might have a small baby, you might have small children, you might not be able to take children to childcare for whatever reason. Having a family room already makes a statement and that I think that's something that I really want people to take away from this. Even if the majority of MPs aren't engaged, even if the majority of staff think what's this got to do with us, by doing an assessment, by having an action plan and then taking some steps, it's raising awareness, it's making a difference, it's starting to say that this parliament cares about gender sensitivity. And I, I can give some uh, lovely examples. It, I was involved at the latter stages in, in the Kenyan parliament, and it was really interesting because gender equality itself was not a general topic of conversation for the public. So when we worked with the staff, it was a new idea for many. And you could almost see light bulbs going on in people's heads at certain times, understanding that things uh, weren't quite as they'd always thought. So even down to the fact that they decided that they ought to have more female security guards to make the process of coming into parliament more female friendly, amazing. It was a simple step, but it made uh, a difference. So my final point really is understanding that there are benefits for everyone. There are, and that's what gets parliaments on board with this. So yes, it was the women MPs in the UK who campaigned to have the childcare facilities. How many younger male MPs do I see taking their children to that facility and picking them up. I tell you, it's quite a lot. It's added to the diversity of Parliament overall. It's no longer the preserve of older men. And when you bring in those younger generations who have different attitudes, you start to see the changes happening. It does take time, but it can and it will happen. Thank you.
Dear Miss Mann, thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. It is always a pleasure to hear real life examples from all over the OSC region. And I'm sure our parliamentarians and all our participants enjoyed your presentation greatly. Um, we have reached the point of the agenda when it would be the best opportunity if there are any comments or statements from our participants or guests. If this is not the case, uh, I would turn back to my dear um, Sasha, who will give uh, floor to our speakers for their concluding, short concluding remarks. Yeah, let's wait for a second. There, there, there's no, no showed interest for comments and statements in the chat. A last call. Okay, well, then in this case, um, as we have a very limited time, our dear colleagues, and we have still the closing remarks um, from uh, our dear Juliana Tesova from Odir's side, I would kindly ask um, our dear four speakers, um, Sonia Palmieri, Hedy Fry, Crotilda Bushka, and Meg Mann, uh, for a final statement. Each of you, if you agree, one key message in a minute. I know it's very hard to uh, stay limited to a minute, but if you could agree to that one final statement from your side, one maybe last lesson learned or a last call or a last uh, proposal, and then we would move to the uh, to the closing remarks so that um, yeah you can go on with your with your commitments um, uh, and that we can close the event on time. So let's start first with our dear uh, Sonia Palmieri, dear Sonia. Uh, your your final statement. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I wanted to uh, just reflect on uh, all three of the of the kind of commentators. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the impressive work that has happened in Canada, not just on gender mainstreaming and the gender plus. Uh, based analysis, which has now really been at the forefront and provides a fantastic role model for so many parliaments, but also on violence-free parliaments. Canada has, of course, I think its response to violence-free parliaments has been instigated by incidences of um, alleged rape, bullying, harassment. This is a common kind of catalyst for improvement and for inquiry. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, I, I am so impressed by what is happening also in Albania. Uh, and I think the, the kind of the, the, just something that links um, those, those comments with what Meg was saying in the UK and the value of political parties. Um, I note the kind of the challenge of political parties and the reality of political parties. And I think when, when people like me, and I, I know Meg's not talking directly to me, but it, but it is, I think, a professional um, kind of hazard to consider the parliament as an, as a, an apolitical institution. I'm not, I'm not suggesting it is. I, I don't really think it is. I, I was in a former life parliamentary staff. I've seen politics at play. But I do think that technical um, suggestions for gender sensitive improvement that miss the politics are going to fail. And so it is always essential to remember <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the I, I guess sometimes the detrimental, yes, they're competitive, but also the detrimental um, kind of work of political parties in, I think what, what, what we've discovered in the Australian context is that when there is a win at all costs, and so it has to be uh, that my political party wins, and it doesn't matter what kind of pain and suffering is caused in that process, that is a problem. So that kind of culture must end. It doesn't mean that politics cannot continue. It just means that it doesn't have to come at the expense, usually, of women's participation and leadership. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Sasha.
Thank you, Sonia. That's a very strong statement and uh, for all of us to, to take away. Um, I would also like to uh, just uh, make you aware of the comment of our Honorable Bojana Jelušić, the chair of the Gender Equality Committee uh, from Montenegro. Bojana was also just highlighting that the Montenegrin Parliament will host on the 16th of May the uh, uh, Women's Parliament, and a regular event that is been, being hosted by the uh, Montenegrin uh, Parliament. And um, uh, yeah, Odir has the privilege to be there and to uh, present uh, uh, our guide, but also to discuss ways forward uh, based on the guide. So thank you, uh, Madam Jelušić, for, for your comment. Uh, we continue now with our Honorable Hedy Fry with her uh, final statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I wanted to, to sort of pull together, but highlight one thing that the last speaker said when she talked about parliaments being political. And we are seeing in many parliaments around the world right now, especially in Europe and in North America, a polarization of the politics. Political parties are so polarized that they are actually they don't care about public policy anymore. They just want to win at all costs. They want to fight a fight and make sure that they denigrate the other party. And in two party systems, that's a very dangerous thing to happen. So th that's, that's something to remember. But I started off with my statement saying that the first thing that must occur to move the agenda forward for gender sensitive parliaments is going to have to be political will. And it starts at the top. It must start with the leaders of political parties. It must start with uh, the decision makers and the cabinet ministers in political parties to move forward to make those changes. And one final thing uh, it reminds me of, of, of a little joke when I was minister for women's equality in, um, in, the, in the parliament in, in the 1990s and early 2000. Um, I remember that we had one session in which we went all 24 hours for three days and three nights. And that was when uh, three women MPs who had just had babies didn't know what to do because they couldn't leave the room when they were voting. And so um, they began to breastfeed their children in the actual parliament itself while it was voting and going on. And everyone around uh, ensured that that was done and that was readily done and that these women didn't have to leave their seats and to therefore disqualify their votes while they were doing that. And I think that that's the kind of thing we need to do. We want to encourage women to come to parliaments and want to encourage family friendly and gender sensitive parliaments. That, and, and I think I just wanted to quickly comment about the idea that young male parliamentarians have changed their attitudes. In fact, in our political parties, uh, Women's Caucus, we have at least five young men who are members and who participate fully in discussing some of the things that we'll do with gender sensitivity. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Uh, we have one last minute question in the chat. If the remaining two speakers would like maybe to, to comment on that quickly. Um, Naida Kujukalic, uh, who is, I believe, a program coordinator at uh, Heinrich Bull Stiftung, is asking whether there are any thoughts on gender quota in parliaments as uh, she says that even the women who are chosen uh, and elected to the parliament may be actually running politics that affect women themselves, um, I guess, uh, in a negative way. So if the remaining two speakers would like to, to comment quickly. Yes, and I would give now the floor to uh, Honorable uh, Ms. Bushka, if she would like to say, one final strong message. It seems to be that um, um, Clotilda Bushka had some uh, has mm -hmm. some con issues with the connection because we lost her uh, camera also before. Maybe we can continue with our dear Megman, um, and if Clotilda is is back, she can then. Um, chip in once Meg is done. Please, Meg. Okay, thank you very much. Just to answer Naida's question, uh, we used to have a saying when I was in Parliament is that not all women are sisters. So yes. that, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that you can't necessarily rely upon all women <laughs> wanting to work on gender equality. 
equally, I always used to say to women who were going forward for election, you have a choice. You can be a woman who campaigns and focuses on women's issues alongside other things, but you can be that woman. You don't have to be. I think it's wrong for us to you know, say to all women going into parliament, you have to be active on these issues. We don't say that to men, so why should we say it to women? Um, it doesn't affect the fact that, that where it's possible to have a, a, a gender quota in parliament, that, that you should still have a gender quota. Um, we need that range of views just because some women are going to do things which may not be in favour of uh, women's uh, greater equality. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a, have a quota. It absolutely doesn't. So, um, and I think recognising the role of men, sometimes I would rather support a man because I think they're going to be more supportive of gender equality than, than a woman. Men are also <laughs> part of this, uh, uh, the solution. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to say two things. The firstly about Sonia's point on it's really destructive when people want to win at all costs. I think that's a really important message. But you're not going to get rid of it. That's why when you're looking at changes within a parliament on gender sensitivity, you need to look for the win-win. If there's something in it for everybody, you're more likely to get the change through. And you're not going to get there straight away. So that's my, and my final message is this is a continuous process. As things start to change, people then start to see the benefit of it. And I put Parliament TV on the other day and across the Conservative benches. So my opposition, you know, party in opposition to, to Labour, although they're the party in government, sadly, uh, there were loads of women. You know, and they're just sitting there and they're part of there and it's no longer a big issue. And it's no longer a big issue because Labour made it a big issue uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And the other party then looked out of date and had to catch up. You know, we're not going to solve these things overnight, but take some steps forward, move forward, go forward with that continuous process. And there will be change. There'll be change for the next generation and the one after that. So keep going. Don't give up because we haven't been able to do it all at once. Nothing in life is that easy. Thank you, Meg. Meg, thank you a lot for this concrete and inspiring um, words. Um, with those, we are now coming to the end of the event. I would like to kindly invite Dr. Yulia Netesova, Chief of Democratic Governance and Gender Unit within Audio to deliver the closing remarks with five uh, key messages to take away. Thank you very much, dear Sasha, dear colleagues, um, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is a big privilege for me to close the today event um, uh, that is devoted to the presentation of the publication on gender sensitive parliaments that was done by my team. Thanks a lot, dear Sasha, for all the hard work that you've put uh, into this together with our experts, Sonia Palmieri, dear Sonia, thanks a lot. Um, I also would like to thank all the parliaments that responded to our survey, providing concrete facts that we could base our research on. Uh, the guide is available now in English and Russian and more national versions are also coming with the support of the field offices. I would strongly encourage all of you to take a look at this publication and um, read it with a forward looking way in terms of actions, next actions that your parliaments uh, can take in line of what is outlined there and what is very much in line with what was said today by all these speakers, very inspiring uh, presentations that show that parliamentary houses around the OEC space are going through this amazing transition more and more into becoming gender sensitive institutions, which is very important for OEC as a, um, as a security organization. We see security and stability uh, possible only if our democratic institutions are truly inclusive and represent men and women in all full spectrum of their, of their needs. As mentioned before, we in ODIR had the privilege to work with uh, several participating states recently, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, Malta, Tajikistan, and we look forward to, uh, to, more, uh, to work with more parliaments, of course. Uh, we'll not do any spoilers, but there might be a longer list uh, next year. Uh, we, of course, not only want the parliaments to become gender sensitive, but we also wish to see cross-party cooperation 
built on this that will lead to concrete outcomes. Our common goal is to deliver for all men and women in all their diversities. And as a summary of today's discussion, I would like to conceptualize on behalf of ODIR a call for continued commitment to gender responsive institutional transformation that is built around five concrete steps. And it is addressed to all of the parliaments, to our dear colleagues from OECPA, uh, all across the OEC space. The first step would be to create political will and leadership commitment. It is very important that speakers, chiefs of parliamentary administration, and key leaders in parliaments commit to this transformation process. The support from the leadership is fundamental. We need to be open to learn and critically review our achievements and especially shortcomings. Parliaments need to be ready not to do things the way it was always done. And we in ODIR stand ready to support uh, those who are willing to do so. So the second step would be actually conducting the systematic and participatory gender assessment or audit. Um, sometimes the leadership of the parliament is aware of certain shortcomings, but from our experience, usually it is just the tip of the iceberg and there is a need to really sit down and look into different areas, the way parliaments, very complex institutions as mentioned today function, of course, with the support of the leadership. The third step would be the implementation of the recommendations in the form of parliament gender action plan. So once the audit is conducted, the next step, the third step is to have the gender action plan for the parliament. Of course, majority of OEC participating states have uh, gender equality strategy or national action plans, but not all of them have a section specific to the parliament. Some do, but some don't. And we always encourage, it is a best practice to have a specific action plan for the parliament. Uh, fourth step is capacity building for MPs and staff of the parliament. Gender transformation is possible only if we are ready to learn, raise awareness, work with our biases, blind spots, and develop knowledge on technical tools. Uh, and of course, in case parliament doesn't have internal resources, um, other partners are ready to help academia, international partners like ODIR. Finally, the fifth step is actually introduction of the new structures and mechanisms. During the audit, during the assessment, very often we see that there is, um, there is a lack of a important functional structure, shall it be a position of gender advisor or maybe a support unit or resource center that would actually, in a more systematic way, will take upon this issue and do it in the years ahead. Uh, so there would be a need to, to take a decision on this, um, allocate budget line and develop clear protocol and rules for the future gender sensitive oversight. And in a way, this process continues over the years. We have some parliaments in OEC that are doing this for the fourth time around and we also always encourage every participating state to have it on an ongoing basis. Um, so these five steps might you know, sound like a lot of work, but they are not rocket science. ODIR developed a very clear step-by-step -step methodology as well, which will be, will be soon published um, on our website as an annex to the publication. Um, from our side, we can see OEC parliaments continue demonstrating their interest and commitment to become more gender sensitive. And this is, of course, music to our ears and a victory to all of us that there is this desire um, to go forward. So let's, let us continue working on this path together on behalf of OEC ODIR. Thank you very much, dear participants, for your time, for your interest. And we look forward to more work together in the months and years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Yulia, for reiterating these five very important recommendations. Um, we will make sure to share these uh, with our participants after the event, together with the presentations and together with the document that will contain some key points that were discussed today. Um, as you can see, uh, the discussion continued in the chat. Uh, we are happy to see that and we regret that we didn't have more time to commit to the discussion. Um, however, I think this is something that we need to understand that this is not a one-time thing and this is not a one-time event. We should continue talking about this and uh, exchanging experiences with our parliamentarians. I hope you found this event useful and interesting. I believe that we can all agree that there are 
some significant policy challenges in this context, but this should not discourage us. On the contrary, it is extremely important that we continue talking about this, looking for adequate and long-term uh, solutions and supporting OSC parla parliaments in this regard. With this, we have come to an end of today's event. Be before we close the session, I would like to thank again all our speakers for their valuable insights, all our participants for sharing their views on this important topic. A big thank you goes to the OSC PA president, Margareta Sederfeld, uh, as well as our Secretary General, Roberto Montella as well as our dear first deputy director, Yabiko, who was here uh, with us today, and our dear director, uh, Matteo Mecacci, who I know all greatly support our work on gender equality. Um, finally, I would like to thank all the colleagues in the OSEPA and ODIR who worked on organizing this event. And finally, a big thank you to our interpreters who have stayed with us um, even for these additional three, four minutes. Thank you all, and the meeting is closed.